We've got a lot of questions on movies, Godfrey de Boyon, and Charles opines on millennials being in a perpetual state of adolescence. Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu, now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with the trickster, Charles Coulomb. The trickster? That's a noun, not an adjective. You think you're not going to notice the difference? (laughs) You could have said tricksterish. I I feel like we've done nouns before. I feel like it's a modifier. It's... I I don't think so. I really don't think so. Trickster? So so you're not a trickster? No, uh, I consider you might consider me to be tricksterish. Mm, I can tricky. see that. Um, yes, perhaps. I prefer to think of myself, however. As helpful. Hmm. Let me write that down. Helpful. Okay. You see, what what does the trickster do? What is the real reason for the trickster? You know, it, it's funny you're, you're, you've accused me of this because a couple of days ago was Carl Jung's birthday. And to celebrate, I took one of them personality tests. Now, according to the personality test, and of course, you can always depend on anything that comes up online to be 100% accurate, because if it wasn't accurate, it wouldn't be online, right? So I'm sure that this is a lot better than spending thousands of dollars to be analyzed by a Jungian specialist. But here it is. They they say that uh, you've got your inner person, uh, yourself, and your outer person, the persona, which is the, the the face you put onto the world. And so you take this test and they tell you which of the of his archetypes predominates in your persona and in yourself. Well, I took the test. And according to this test, which has to be right because it was online, my persona, my outward persona, is the trickster. But my my inner self, my personal reality, who I who I really am, that is the trickster. Wait, I don't get it. So your persona wait, your inner self or your persona? Well no, see my persona, the outward self that I show everyone, is the trickster. But my in my inner self, my real personage that is just for me, is the trickster. You just said the same thing for both inner and outer. Yeah, I know. So you're a trickster. Well, let's just say I'm consistent. And let's say that, let's also say that the persona is really what I am. I'm not concealing anything. You should feel proud of that or something. Yeah. To thine own self be true. And indeed, and everyone else in this case, I was actually quite surprised. There was one difference, however, in terms of lesser archetypes present. You'll be happy to know that I possess at once the wise old man and the poor Eternos. Eternos? What is that? Yes, the eternal child and the wise old man in one person. Isn't that weird? I could see that. <laughs> you're, not being, you're not being nice. Also, there was the the, uh, the 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 last one was the father, the the perpetual father who uh, uh, brings stability and reassures people that things aren't completely terrible. So I'm stuck being all at once, primarily the trickster, but I'm also the wise old man and the eternal child as well as a reassuring father figure. Wow, you really have multiple personalities. Well, I've only got the one, you know, so I don't know what I don't know what it all means. I'm just accepting. Wow. 
Um, However, today, speaking of accepting people, in real time, we are on a very special day. Uh, what day is it today? It's the 29th, I thought. What is it? Yeah, 29th. St. Martha. The dragon killer, you know, she who killed the Tarask. But it's also the birthday of a great personal hero to many of the members of my generation. Um... A man to whom young people in the 60s, when I was a boy, looked up to as a martyr for his beliefs. Well, I have no idea uh, then. A man who worked hard to help people, to help the world be a better place, so that we could leave a better world to those who came after. A man who dreamt of a world at peace. Okay, a get, man who dared. What, get, what? To the, get to the punchline, Charles. You are very, <laughs> very, what's the word, impatient. I mean, this, let me tell you something. This guy's example sent thousands of American children onto the streets on Halloween to go trick-or-treating for UNICEF. What does it even mean, trick-or-treating for UNICEF? What does it mean? I mean, okay, there were certain, you there go were trick or treating, you get candy. Okay, cool, but you you had a little box for UNICEF, United Nations uh, Children's Emergency Fund, and that money was raised to help suffering children around the world in places where war or natural disaster or disease or famine had left them vulnerable, and the United Nations Agency for Children in emergency problems, UNICEF, was a primary way of helping these children. And so right-thinking, high-minded boys and girls in my era would go trick-or-treating for UNICEF. They would bring along a little UNICEF box, and the people in the different houses would give them you know, a buck or 50 cents or whatever. And then, when it was all over, when they came back, they would turn the money over to the UNICEF man. I mean, that's not trick or treating. That's like begging. That's like. What do you think trick or treating was? I mean, but that's candy. High stakes philanthropy. At any rate, so today is the birthday of the man who inspired all that. Dag Hammarskjöld. So that's why you you always refer to trick or treating for UNICEF. I never knew what that meant. But now, after hearing the actual plan of that, I can see why you refer to that, because it's so pathetic. I did. <laughs> pathetic. It's it's pathetic. It's idealistic. You're getting, you children to, to, you're getting children to... Help to, other children. You're getting the children of prosperity to help other children across the globe. Can't you see that we're all brothers and sisters? Look here. Look at my lapel. In honor of Dag Hammarskjöld, what am I wearing? Uh, United Nations pin, I would presume. You would presume correctly. And I've got my <laughs> UN tie. Is that a UN tie? That just looks like... It's actually more of an atomic tie. Atomic <laughs> I... tie to be honest with you. <laughs> but it's the closest I've got. Okay. It's, but this is my UN ensemble. When I, I, you know, it goes along with the Swedish modern furniture and the uh, the cool jazz playing in the background. No, I, I, uh, I always think of three logos together because when I was a little boy uh, in New York, these three logos were very popular, and somehow they merged in my head. One was for the UN, one was for NASA, and the other was the uh, Perisphere, I think it was called of the uh, 1964 World's Fair in New York. Okay, so let, let's bring it back, because I, I can't get off this. So what year did he want trick-or-treating for UNICEF to happen? 
Well, it started, uh, actually, it started about the time I was born, and it uh, went into the mid-60s. I have to admit, I never actually did it, but I often thought about doing it. Okay, th- that was going to be my next question. What was your actual emotional reaction? Like, did you embrace it into your bosom, or did you be like, this guy's a, this guy's a con artist. <laughs> this guy's using me as... <laughs> Do you really think I would have said to my mom and dad, let him do his own trick or treating? <laughs> if he wants it so badly, do you really think I would have said something like that? <laughs> I'll have you know that I, you know what my first Halloween costume was? What? And this would have been Halloween of uh, probably 64. Uh, it was a heckle of Jekyll costume. Like the crows? Yes. <laughs> how, how, how are you two crows? Well, because you actually had their faces. It was it was a black uh, costume, but it had their faces in yellow, and then the mask was a single crow. But you had the two of them there, Heckle and Jekyll. I see. I've actually found that that exactly that costume online. Believe it or not, I found a picture of it. It just seems to me that 1964 Westchester County was the epitome of Halloween. Hmm. Okay. I don't think there's been another Halloween like it. <laughs> of course, of course not. Of course not. And no, I didn't go trick or treating for uh, for uh, UNICEF, but it wasn't because I was rejecting the legacy of Dan Cavistrol, as you imply. Watch out for that fan. Sounds like you're in the middle of a of a windy field. There we go. Well, I, I am in the middle of a windy field. It's <laughs> rushing inside my head. But uh, what do, what does the UN mean to you as a person? The UN, that's the place where they have a lot of flags, and then they meet, and then the third <laughs> world countries try to be loud and beg the big countries to for aid. So you don't have a very high opinion of the United Nations. I mean, I, I don't even feel like, I mean, does the United Nations even matter? I mean, how do they get money? What do they do? Oh, the money? How do they get money? It's uh, given by the member states. Well, some of them anyway, the ones who can afford to. You'll never guess who the largest single donor is. That's probably true. I probably can't guess. What What is the largest single donor? The United States of America. Oh, okay. But. The UN functions, and Dag Hammarskjöld gave his life in the cause of peace. Well, good for him. Uh, great, well done. You don't Dag. seem impressed. You don't seem impressed. All right, fine. We'll move along then. This will impress you, though. On Monday night, Monday is July thirty-first. Monday night. When you come home, you better lock the doors, draw the drapes, and hide under the bed. That's St. John's Eve. Wait, what is it? Lammas Eve. Oh. August 1st is Lammas Day. So you know, it's another one of the hide under the bed nights. <laughs> wow. What's the story with with that? I forgot. Well, it's actually, Lammas is the beginning of the uh, grain harvest. And in the old days, what it comes from is the uh, Anglo-Saxon for loaf mass. And so what would happen is that the first, uh, they would make uh, the communion bread from the first, uh, the very first grain harvested in the field. And that's what was called the loaf mass. Oh, okay. And uh, it, they basically, you know, it was it was the beginning of the harvest season. It's funny we think of August as summer, and it truly is in terms of temperature. But it was the beginning of the harvest, which uh, will really go all out in October. The October country. 
So yeah, we're coming up on August. What what's uh, August the month of? So we're we're going from the the month of the the precious blood to. Well, let's see. the the big feast is the Assumption of Our Lady. But what is it the month of? Yeah, it's a good question. August Catholic month of. It is, ah, traditionally dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Mm. There you go. Oh. Because August 22nd was the original date of uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now it's the Queenship of Mary in the new, uh, in the new calendar. Mm. Okay. But the, uh, in the new calendar is the Queenship of Mary, but it's uh, in the traditional calendar, it's the Immaculate Heart. Okay. All right. Um, time for the memes of production. Nationalize the memes of production. For the common good. We've got some proper memes uh, today. Uh, first one is from uh, Aurora. Uh, and she she posted an interesting one. I don't know. This is a little weird. Charles um, and then recite song lyrics. So Charles likes reciting uh, song lyrics and he embraces it. I and then Char here, this lower one, Charles recites song lyrics, but then you've got this creepy tentacle person saying Vincent now expecting it, and then Charles is sweating and then kind of uncomfortable. Huh. That's I I don't know if that's that if that's accurate. I mean I don't feel like I make you uncomfortable in that sense when it's like no really. Uh, I mean look, uh, little orphan Annie didn't have a family. She was a lonely little girl. Yeah, see, you, you just you just unleash it all the time without even worrying, without a, a all care. the time. Yeah, all the time, nonstop. All right, next. Really, one. I'm leaving on a jet plane. Don't know when I'll get back again. <sighs> oh, babe, I hate to go. What? Okay. What do uh, we got against song lyrics? Nothing. It's just a strange way to embark on a conversation. <laughs> All right. Depends on who you're about. But what if you were trick or treating with, uh, for UNICEF? How would you start the conversation then, if not with song lyrics? Well, that's fair. Uh, sing me a, yeah. a trick or treating for UNICEF song. What, what would you sing if you're trick or treating for UNICEF? Well, well, that is a good <laughs> question. What would I sing for her to for UNICEF? That's, uh, that's like an impossible question. I don't expect oh, you to. Oh, don't you be so sure. Uh, <laughs> oh, love for sale. <laughs> Delectable love for sale. No. Uh, to your dream, UNICEF, I think probably uh, it would be... Uh, Pay up, pay up, pay up, and pay the game. <laughs> All right. Um, we've got uh, another meme, uh, this time from Andrew from New Jersey. Let's see what he has to put up. Oh, this is what every Catholic podcast set looks like. <laughs> and then just... It's not what this one looks like. No, not right now. That's so dead on. I. We started out that way, though, with books. When we were in the same studio, we had books. Based on Andrew's comments, it sounds like he's really surveying the landscape of Catholic podcasts, and it sounds like he's really frustrated with most of them. Uh, but I could be wrong. But that's interesting, Andrew. So, thank well, you for what is meeting. what is he want? Dead puppies? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Unicef uh, trick or treaters, perhaps. Um, well, you know, actually, someone, um, I think, uh, super fan um, Jeff. I think on comments, he had such a good comment. I'm going to impromptu delve into it um, because it was so interesting. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, because it was common. He, he was comparing uh, our podcast with others and how like our difference in approach. And let me see if I can find it. Um here we go. Oh no, it, it wasn't uh, Super Fan Jeff. It um, I'm not sure who this was. Uh, someone with the alias Grunt One Two Three Nine Four. 
Um, he says, I was watching Matt Frad talk about Catholic homesteading and all the stuff about how to combat the insanity of our anti-Christian culture. Then I turn into Off the Menu, and you're talking about Ruritania and all these fake countries and all this random insanity. I find the latter more effective for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is true, ladies and gentlemen. Random insanity, uh, apart from running in, in my family, uh, random insanity is a tool in the fight to stay sane. Mm. You know, your master's... Uh, want children to be mutilated and uh, they want them to be taught all sorts of garbage. So the proper response was, yes, but did you know that Queen Flavia rules alone in Ruritania now, the last of all the Elfbergs? How about that, Mr. Smart Master of all you survey? How about that, huh? So, as, a, uh, as a worthless toad in charge, what is it like knowing that you may at this very moment be pissing off the angry red planet mm. they don't have an answer for that do they yeah yeah so that was from super fan nate who's been thank watching you, us nate. for forever yeah thank you so much uh really really fun comment um we got one more meme lots of memes from super fan rob he's a he's a fellow paisan so this so keep this in mind this is an italian gentleman at least i'm pretty sure rob um so uh he has uh so the girl says, babe, please stop posting about restoring the French monarchy. You're not even French. And then he says, vive le roi. Is that vive le roi. Yeah. Vive le roi. <laughs> well, you, you know, there is something compelling about it. What can I tell you? Have you ever considered that paying your income tax is actually LARPing? Well, I don't think the United States government feels that way, but... Um... No, they don't, but it, it's LARPing. Uh, can, can you explain that? Yeah. You're pretending you matter to them, that they care, and that you have some sort of say, some sort of influence over what our masters do. It's all LARPing. We should just we should rename it. Instead of calling it the uh, income tax, it should just be called tribute. <laughs> that doesn't have okay there's a little bit of different connotation there but okay oh, really what, what do you mean well, well, I don't get it I think I think calling it our tribute is the best word this is my annual tribute and I pay off my master in return for being allowed to live my life what's wrong with that suggest a coercive relationship um Oh, 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 it's not? Don't pay your income tax and find out what happens. If that's not a coercive relationship, I don't know what is. We pay our tribute to our masters. Well, you know, each relationship, you know, there are certain <laughs> rules in each relationship, yeah, oh, in personal oh. relationships. Yes. And Especially you can see it as a black mask. you can choose to look at all the downsides, you know, all the rules that you have to follow. Oh, I have to clean the dishes. I have to take out the trash, blah, blah, blah. And, but then there's good sides, too. They, they, they don't care. They just want my money. <laughs> they really don't care if I put out the trash or not. Honestly, they really don't. Although, if I leave the trash out there long enough, the city will seize my home. Well, that's true. Yeah, see? And you're saying it's not a coercive relationship? Of course it is. So, as I say, when you call it the income tax, you use all these terms, it's LARPing. We should be honest. We pay our masters their tribute. See how simple that is? Well, it's more like it's like a paternal relationship. And so it's like when you're bad, then you get punished. And then it's yeah, like but when you're, you. when you're good, you don't get anything. That's that's not a very paternal No, that's not true. When you're good, you get tax incentives and you get money. You see? Uh, so, yeah, but the money is being taken from your tribute. No, the money is, is being created for us out of... Uh... <laughs> out of the air. By the court magicians. <laughs> from the money tree. <laughs> the court magicians wave their wands and there's money. 
No, I, I mean, what, what always makes you laugh is uh, when people expect you to be grateful for your, for your income tax return. But it was my money to begin with. That's true. I mean, what what am I to be grateful for? That my masters have given me a little bit more out of the tribute than they did before. Okay, I'm grateful. There, satisfied. <laughs> yeah, I I never thought of it that way. I guess. Um, but well, that's what the trickster is here for to get you to think differently. Sort of like an unending ad for Apple. All right, trickster, get out of the windy field. We 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 roamed into the windy field again. Oh. All right, here we go. Wasn't that the name of a dancer you used to know? Windy field. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just seemed appropriate. Yeah. All right. Um... (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on this or any other stage, give it up for Miss Windy Field. (laughs) All right. uh, Book of the Week. Let me ask you. What? Who's walking down the streets of the city, smiling at everybody she sees? Who's leading over to catch I the I know moment? that song, actually, through Breaking Everyone Bad. Everyone knows windy. it's windy. It's windy? I thought it was it's windy. windy. And windy has stormy eyes that flash at the sound of lies. And windy has wings to fly above the skies. See? And you thought she wasn't even worth talking about because she was just a dancer. I thought it was actually going to be okay. Well, anyhow, I had other thoughts, <laughs> but um... I'm not. I, I I'm not your your moral chaperone, pal. You okay, sell some of the time. I I can't help you. Okay, anyhow. Um. All right, moving on. Uh... Right. Moving on. Nothing to see here. Moving on. You've all got houses to go to. Move on now. All right. Book of the week. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question. Are you ready? Can you can you dig it? Yeah. The book of the week. Try not to get excited. Try not to get frightened. The book of the week is, uh, drumroll please, uh, Dandelion Wine. You did that last week. Are you kidding me? No, I didn't. I did something wicked this way comes. You did not. I wrote it down. I have it time stamped. Dandelion Dandelion Wine. Wine. Perfect summer book. All right, fine. Be that way. Then I'll do another one. John Carter of Mars, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Ooh. The first volume in the 14, uh, the 14 volume uh, Barsoom series, in which an American Civil War veteran, John Carter, finds himself transported to the planet Mars. But this Mars is not the, the horrible, dry, dead joint that uh, our probes are scurrying around right now. No, no, no. This was the, the Mars of the 19th century imagination with canals and dying a dying planet. And against the backdrop of various bizarre Martian races, John Carter appears trying to bring a little Earth-style truth, justice, and the American way to the uh, angry red planet, Barsoom. So what's the name of the book? Uh, actually, I think the uh, the first ver- the first uh, volume is called A Princess of Mars. Princess of Mars. Okay. Um, That's the first of fourteen volumes. Didn't, didn't Disney do like a um, a movie called John Carter, which perhaps I mean was that based on this? Do you know about that? It was. It was indeed. I saw the film when it came out. It wasn't too bad, but it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't great. Uh, it's a, it would be a tough book to really do justice to. But Edgar Rice Burroughs himself was the author of a lot of series like this, primarily a boy's fiction. Tarzan of the Apes was his best-known character. And he lived for a good chunk of his life in the beautiful San Fernando Valley, specifically in a part of the valley called, try to guess. Well, I have no idea. 
Um, well, he named his ranch, which is now the name of a town or a section of L.A. now is annexed in the valley after one of his most famous characters. John Carter? What? I don't know. What? John Carter? More famous than John Carter was Tarzan. Oh, there's a section of the valley called Tarzan? Tarzana. Tarzana. I'm not familiar, actually. Well, now you know. And to this day, the Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, company that he founded and administers the thing, and is still run by his family, uh, they still have the headquarters, the headquarters at the old ranch. But even though it's a, a worldwide thing. I was a big Edgar Rice Burroughs fan when I was a kid. Hmm. And I love Tarzan and Barsoom and uh, his stories of Venus and various other things. So check it out, A Princess of Mars. That, I think that's the first for, first volume. Let me make sure I know what I'm talking about. Um, it certainly is not the Mars of science that we have today. When he was writing, nobody really knew. Uh yeah, it's the first volume, The Princess of Mars. Hmm. And as uh, the introduction is, uh, A Princess of Mars is a science fantasy novel by American writer Edgar Rice Burroughs, the first of his Barsoom series. It was first serialized in the pulp magazine, All Story Magazine, from February, July, 1912. Full of swordplay and daring feats, the novel is considered a classic example of 20th century pulp fiction. It is also a seminal instance of the planetary romance, a subgenre of science fantasy that became highly popular in the decades following its publication. Its early chapters also contain elements of the Western. The story is set on Mars, imagined as a dying planet with a harsh desert environment. This vision of Mars was based on the work of the astronomer Percival Lowell, whose ideas were widely popularized in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Barsoom series uh, inspired a number of well-known 20th century science fiction writers, including Jack Vance, Ray Bradbury, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert A. Heinlein, and John Norman. The series was also inspirational for many scientists in the fields of space exploration and the search for extraterrestrial life, including Carl Sagan, who read A Princess of Mars when he was a child, as did I. All hail Barsoom. Okay. You never read that when you were a kid? I never read it. Kind of racy book covers, to be honest, looking at it on Amazon, but okay. Um, Don't judge a book by its cover. You should be the last person I'd have to tell that to. But yeah, they did the uh, Edgar Ross Burroughs, uh, thanks to the work of an Italian artist called Frank Frazetta, got a lot of racy covers. Believe me, the contents of the book don't live up to the raciness of the cover. Oh, I see. Okay. Very good, Charles. Um, all right, questions. Yes. All right. Uh, a couple questions from Rob, um, super fan Rob, who says, Charles recently referred to Gallicanism and ha- – um, it sounds a, a lot like Americanism. Would Charles please define the two heresies and you can com- compare and contrast them? Well, the similarities between the two is that both felt that the church and their respective countries should be different from the rest of the world and more into local management. So that's where they resemble each other. From there, the resemblance stops because that's as far as Gallicanism went. But with Americanism, you had added stuff. The idea that... Uh, the church and state arrangements uh, in America were the best in the world and what the rest of the world should be based on, that the church in America should be different, not like the church in France, which uh, was under a king who was considered the oldest son of the church, the heir of Charlemagne and Clovis, but simply because our democracy is so much better than anything else anybody's ever done. It also included the notion that the uh, active virtues are superior to the contemplative ones and thus had a whole a very very different frame of reference than regular catholicism 
whereas Gallicanism was a bit off, but nothing like Americanism. It, what, what was Gallicanism again? It was a bit off, but it, it was the idea that the church in France should be separate in a sense and independent from the church and the rest of the world and more under the control of the French king than under the pope. But it didn't re-examine the doctrines of the church the way Americanism did. I'm trying my best to stay out of uh, church, you know, church news and church politics. But um, based off the small things I hear about the direction of the synods and synodality and all this and that, isn't that um, sort of uh, an emphasis? Is the localization? Well, that's what they say, but then the uh, then they'll turn around and say that you've got to if you're going to have the Latin Mass, Rome has to approve your bulletins, your parish bulletins. So you know it's got whatever orify they're speaking out of, they're speaking to each other the wrong way. It's it's all garbage. It's whatever they want it to be. I I listen. It was the same way after the council. They would just. <laughs> stuff would come out of their snouts or whatever, orify, and you were supposed to take it seriously and believe it meant something. It didn't mean anything then, it doesn't mean anything now. It means they're in charge, you're not, to which you're told, shut up. Okay. Got it. And in 20 years, when they're all dead, we'll see what they're saying then. All right. Of course, I'll be in the same boat, so I better not be too mean. What do dead liars do? Uh, they lie dead. <laughs> no, they lie. They lie still. Yeah. God <laughs> grant that she lies still. Uh, all right. Uh, so, Robert sent this, I guess, a while ago. So he says today, in real time, uh, is the anniversary of the liberation of the Holy Sepulcher in 1099. Yes. Oh, what has Charles been hiding about Godfrey de Bouillon, and where can I find more to read on him? Sincerely, the Mad Sicilian. Well, firstly, he was a uh, he was the first uh, Godfrey de Bouillon was probably the first figure in Western history to use food as art. Yeah, he was the inventor of the famous Bouillon cube. Okay, okay, man, dude, because <laughs> you got asked this question before, so yeah, I know, but we... I just I had to throw that out there. I, what the Bouillon cube? You've never seen it before. All right, he had nothing to do with Bouillon cubes. Okay. Okay. Are you happy now? You feel better? <laughs> like you achieved something? You you pulled the truth struggling out of my mouth. Is that what you're happy about now? Fine. Anyway. He had nothing to do with bouillon cubes, but he did. He was the uh, the Duke of Brabant, and he um, and other places, and he gave up uh, to the church his castle to the local bishop of the castle of Bouillon uh, for some of money, so he could afford to go on the crusade. And off he went. Uh, he and his brother Baldwin, with the rest of the crusaders, they were there for the, the crossing of the Bosphorus into Asia Minor. The siege of Antioch and the siege of Jerusalem. Uh, when Jerusalem was liberated from the uh, Muslims, uh, it was then decided because he was at once the the holiest and also the bravest of the leaders of the Crusade. Uh, they agreed that he would be the uh, the king of Jerusalem, but he declared. I will not wear a crown of thorns. Oh, sorry, I will not wear a crown of gold where my Savior wore a crown of thorns. And so he took the title advocate, that is, defender of the Holy Sepulchre. But he died after only a year, and his brother Baldwin did not mind being called King of Jerusalem. However, um, from that time, as long as the kingdom lasted, it was interesting that they were never, they were not crowned at the Holy Sepulchre which you would imagine because it was the, the cathedral, basically, of Jerusalem and the biggest church in the, in the country. 
they were crowned at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. They didn't want to wear a crown of gold where he'd worn a crown of thorns on the one hand. And on the other hand, it was, of course, at Bethlehem that uh, the three kings presented gold. And so it made sort of sense that in acting as Christ the king's lieutenant in the Holy Land, uh, they'd be crowned at Bethlehem. Hmm. Okay. Um, Will says, what caused the Swedish and Norwegian migration to the United States, and why did they settle in places such as Minnesota and Wisconsin? Well, you know, it's because, uh, after all, you know, when you're Scandahoovian. What, what, what do you say Scandahoovian again? Uh, it's a Minnesota joke. It's generic for all Scandahoovians. You know the Scandinavian countries, yes? Yeah. Sweden. Denmark? Yeah. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and? I don't know. Iceland? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Those are the Scandahoovian countries. But to answer the question, uh, there are several reasons. One, the uh, climate was a bit like Scandahoovia. Uh, but more than that, there was a lot of land. They needed settlers badly, and there was a lot of free land. Uh, and there were there had been, in the early 19th century, there had been some uh, economic depressions and things like that in Scandinavia that had made farming a bit difficult. So this vast crowd of people were able to come over and all of them get settled. But they did it on kind of a checkerboard basis. So if you look at the Midwest, it's not just Swedes and Norwegians, but Poles and some Italians, but mostly Poles, Germans from Russia, Swedes, Norwegians, other kinds of Germans, uh, Dutch, in a checkerboard kind of thing. Um, Czechs, uh, Danes. These, these are the kind of people you'll, you'll find in the rural Midwest settled by. Um, and you go into one village and everybody's got a Czech name. Then you drive down the road and they're all Swedes. You drive further down the road, they're Germans from Russia. And so it goes. Hmm. And, of course, they, uh, some of them got help from the railroads in settling uh, in America. And, of course, they all wrote immigrant letters back home to their kin, telling them how wonderful it was and they should come over. All right. Jonathan says, Ayo, Paisani, I have a couple of questions for you. Firstly, I've been attending a local TLM, and there are still a few things that I'm curious about that I have been unable to find information on in any of my reading. When the servers bring the cruets of wine and water to the priests, they do this thing where it looks like they blow over or kiss the cruets before handing them off. What is this about? Also, during the purifications of the vessels, it looks like there are two different cruets of clear liquid, one being water, but what is the other? More water or different substance? Uh, to answer the question, they kiss the cruets as a mark of respect. And in many places, they also kiss the priest's hand after they do that. And again, it's a mark of respect. Uh, the other liquid you see is, in all likelihood, white wine. Uh, interestingly enough, you would think, if you didn't think, if you didn't really look into it, you would think that they would use red wine for mass because it's more like blood. Yeah. But they don't. They usually use white wine. Interesting. Okay. Um, he also asks, what is the history of the Beretta? The clerical hat, not the gun or the car. Leave the gun, take the cannoli. What is its significance in the liturgy? Why did it get thrown out in the revisions? In the West, men traditionally uncover their heads in church, but the Beretta is the opposite. What is that about? Well, originally the Beretta was a development from the uh, medieval doctor's cap. You know, the four-sided thing that you see people wearing it, you know, pictures of old universities and so on. 
and it grew and got more elaborate. Um, and it was originally, it was a, a sign of learning. You see, even today, uh, well, my, uh, my uh, niece-in-law, when she got her pontifical degree, her licentiate, that comes with a Beretta uh, of its own. So she can, in, in uh, academic dress, my niece-in-law can wear a Beretta. Hmm. Uh, so it, it's, it was very much linked to that. Um, but it became the, the regular, uh, the regular, uh, headgear of the priest. Uh, and that's why it made its way into the mass. Uh, after Vatican II, of course, it was just, you know, I just, so, oh, oh, and that's why. Hmm. Weenie Central spoke. Well, you know, Weenie, Weenie Central Ecclesiastical Division. <laughs> you know, it's a really cool um, thing for priests to wear. I, I've always been a fan. I think a lot of people have been a fan, to be honest. I don't know why I went out of style. It's the, the Saturno. Yeah. What What's up with that? Well, it's a Roman hat. You know, they actually have straw ones for the summer. But, uh, and you'll find also the clerical dress did change uh, from place to place. So, for instance, up until Vatican II, uh, French priests didn't wear the Roman collar. They wore the bands, you know, mm. like so. Oh, right. I remember, yeah, uh, like St. John Vianney, they, you've got that. Yeah. Picture. Yeah. And they wore buckled shoes. Uh, but of course they got rid of that because it's just so, oh gee, it's so old fashioned. Oh gee, Willikers, it's awful. I just, <laughs> oh, you know, oh gee, Willikers. I, I really, I remember that era so well. I mean, oh, it's old fashioned. It's irrelevant. No, little moron, you're irrelevant. You know what? I really didn't like what really bothered me more than anything else were these priest theologians dressed up in suits all the time and you never even yeah. see them as priests. That bothered well, me so uh, much. Well, that was to show they were professionals like lawyers or doctors or pimps, you know, or other people of that kind of uh, stature. I mean, honestly, it it was such, you know, I, I, I got into a bit of an argument at Holy Angels some years ago yeah. with the then pastor who, uh, you know, he, he, he did the usual stupid thing. Well, you know, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have uh, Latin at the Last Supper. And I said, they didn't have a collection either, Father. And if we're going to go back to the early church, how about an unpaid priesthood? He says, I don't get, I don't get much money at all. And I said, of course you do, Father. Uh, you know, you you get spending money, which isn't, you know, by itself wouldn't be much. But you have free medical, free dental, a free house, a free servant. She's not a servant. She's a housekeeper. She's a servant. Free house, free car, plus your spending money. You got a pretty good deal. Well, I don't get much compared to other professionals. And that's when I lost it. I said, other professionals? You mean like doctors and lawyers? Father, they wouldn't consider you a colleague. They consider you some sort of shaman, a uh, purveyor of mumbo jumbo. As far as they're concerned, you're not, you're not their colleague. Your colleague is Madame Leota down the street, the card reader. And I'll bet you'll find you're doing a lot better than she is. Well, he wasn't happy, but he couldn't say I was lying. I've heard I've heard that before. That was the thing in Ireland. Uh, one of one of the priests talked in high school and talked to me. Uh, one of the Sacred Hearts priests, and it honestly sounded like in Ireland at the time. I mean, it sounded like they had priests lined up with all the other professions. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it sounded like that. The, to hear them tell it the way they tell it, it's like oh, I could be an engineer or a priest or, you know. 
a plumber. And I, yeah. <laughs> that a was clown. that's weird. A circus clown, uh, a, a trans medium, you know, <laughs> who knows anything that, like that. That's um. Well, that's disappointing to hear that the parish priest say that. Holy Angels, by the way, some inside info for everybody in the audience. That parish is well off. I went to a parish, and the priest at Monsignor, you would say, oh, that's the rich parish. The, those are well, rich people. It, uh, well, it is. And it's, it's the first place you ever encountered the Italian Catholic Federation. That's right. That's right. So. See, I remember these things. Uh, yeah. Um Wow. And let me tell you, the ICF, they're always generous to the parishes they're at. I'm sure. Why? Of course. Yeah. It... So I'm just telling you, if you're a parish priest out there uh, and you're watching this show and you get the chance to get a branch of the ICF at your parish, do it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what do we got next? We got... Um... Oh, no. Jonathan, okay, he asked the third question. Okay, so he says, okay, this isn't a very good question. Let me preface that, okay? So b brace yourself, folks. Okay. So he says, thirdly, if Tumblr House was to publish an album of our wonderful skipper singing old swooner tunes titled Vincenzo LaGuardia Franchini Sings to You, what would Charles recommend as the track list? Uh, I think that Strangers in the Night and Volare should Volare, be, whoa. Yeah. should be on there for sure. But what else? Anyways, nice to see you both at Uncle Amos's 98th birthday last month. I'll never forget the sight of Aunt Jenny dancing on the table of sweet cherry wine. We need to find more of that burgundy next time I'm in town. I, it really turned things up to 11. Ciao, ciao. Okay, that last part was good. Yeah, I think so. It shows, you know, a, a, a cultural sensitivity that you often don't find these days. But to answer your question, well, I would have you sing in addition to those two, Strangers of the Night and Volare. Um, that's Amore, of course. You know, we, we couldn't let you do not do that Amore. Um let me see. Uh, Retourname. Retourname. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, I think uh, I did it my way, my way, of course. Mm, uh, that's after. a nice one. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Oh, uh, well, of course, the Tarantella. Uh, yeah. Of course. Uh, I mean, there's so many of these wonderful old songs that uh, you've always enjoyed hearing me sing. Um, oh, um, um, Domani. Forget about Domani. And um, let's see. Uh, so, so, so many of these rich. Oh, uh, on top of spaghetti. You know that one. Yeah, okay. How about O Sole Mio? Yes, O Sole Mio, Santa Lucia. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, of course, uh, of course, Giovanezza. Uh, today's Mussolini's birthday, too, you know. Oh, okay. Good for him. Yeah, so um, <laughs> you, you ready to sing Giovanezza? All right, that sounds like a good list. Charles, moving on. Uh, 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 yeah. All right. Let me tell you something. You know what my cab driver in Rome told me three weeks ago? What? They're really a two Mussolini. There's the Mussolini before 1936. He, he, he good. The Mussolini, when he attacked into Ethiopia and after, he go off the rails. It's not so good. The first Mussolini, he all right. He's okay. <laughs> so it's what the guy said. You get in conversations with taxi cab drivers nowadays in Rome about Mussolini? Well, yeah, because my uh, nephew Charlitos sitting next to me, we're coming to the Piazza Venezia, 
and I pointed out the Palazzo Venezia from which Mussolini used to speak all the time. It was the, the thing. And that's what got me into the conversation with the cab driver about Mussolini. I see. He said, so, what do you think about Mussolini? You think he was just a dictator, huh? I said, well, no, no, it was more to it than that. It's a little more complex. He says, that's right. People don't understand. And that's what he gave me the... Is, that a, is this a fair characterization? I feel like you're pushing it in a certain in a certain direction. What are you talking about? Okay, okay. What do you mean by that? I mean... Okay, just... What? What are you trying to... No, what do I, I'm not, not going about... to even go here. This is a trap. What is it you want? A trap! This is a trap that you've laid for me and I've stumbled into and I'm going to try to pull myself out right now. What are you talking about? I know. We're, what ha- are you talking we're about? having a conversation about Il Duce on his birthday. What could be more innocent than that? <laughs> Laying a trap for you indeed. You think I'm really going to put you in a position where I could either say, oh, I see, so you support the fascist, or, oh, I get it, you take the, uh, you take the, uh, uh, the consensus narrative. Okay. You think I would do that to you? That I put you into a heads I win, tails you lose situation? You really think I would do that? Yes. All, you, you do that all the time. I, I've never done that. Not once. Well, all right. Maybe once. Well, <laughs> well, maybe three times. But did it ever occur to you that I'm quite capable of having a sincere conversation with an Italian-American about Mussolini without poking fun at anyone's ethnicity? Did that ever occur to you? I think that's debatable, to be honest. <laughs> I truly <laughs> feel like that. <laughs> 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 I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean when you when you go to uh, when when you go to Eastern Europe and you go to Bratislava and you say Bratislava <laughs> yes. to all the people I don't know if you hold back to the Italian bar when it comes to dealing with Italians. I think you just... Well, uh... well, for one thing, remember that Slovaks and Italians are not the same. Well, that's hard for me. Oh, I know. You, you, you've got the... You, you basically got uh, carp swimming in the bathtub yeah. topped with tomato sauce. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> I don't know how they keep it on with the uh, bath water. But... Uh, seriously, no, I, I'll just say that uh, the funny thing about Mussolini, he is very much of a, a complex character. And, and Franklin Roosevelt was quite a fan of his until he invaded Ethiopia. So, you know, I, so I, when the guy said that, I, I knew what he meant. Um, and certainly, he kept Italy out of the worst of the Depression which is something nobody else managed to do with any of their countries. So that's something. All right. Perfect transition. Uh, this is a perfect lead up to the, our next question from Andrew from New Jersey. He says, hello, gentlemen, and greetings from the site of Alexander Hamilton's death at the hands of Aaron Burr, the great state of New Jersey. I'm wondering cool. if Charles saw the new trailer for the film about Napoleon Bonaparte. Starring uh, Joaquin Phoenix in the title oh role. Boy. Oh if boy. he did see it, what are his thoughts? If he did not see it, can Vincent Charles please live react to the trailer on the show? I think Charles doing reaction content would be a real treat. I posted the link below. Okay, I guess we'll we'll do this. I gave Charles the link. Um, ready when you are, Charles. All right. Ready? Steady? Go. go. All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, dead air time, looking at our faces. Uh, 
Okay. Huh. Interesting. Well, you know, it. Uh, other than the uh, music being a little weird, uh, if I'm in a position to, I expect I'll see it. It's, it looks fascinating. Um. Yeah. There, there, there's certain. I feel like. Our, our portrayal of 19th century historical figures bothers me now because I feel like we're, oh, yeah. we're so far removed and we've got such a, a skewed perspective that we miss giant facets of, a, of personalities oh, yeah. that are, are good. That's, that's a given. Um, that's definitely a given. Uh, we yeah. don't do historical films like, well. Like, for example, like consider what... A portrayal of Napoleon in like 1930 would look like, and all the qualities that they would put on him then, and then compare it to what looks like Joaquin Phoenix's, um, I guess, larger than life rendition. You know, where he, you know it's a Game of Thrones contestant. That's what I think of. You know, where it's well, like okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I I won't I won't argue with all of that. I'll just say though that it looks. Looks, uh, you know, again, we're able to do the externals of historical films very well, the mass scenes and things like yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Where where we fall short is the actual portrayals of people. I uh, I remember seeing a movie about seven or eight years ago called Flyboys, which was about uh, American flyers during World War One. Is a beautiful picture. Uh, the only thing wrong with it were the people, but you know the 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 aerial scenes were great. The the everything was fine until people started talking and doing stuff, other than fighting. When they were fighting, they were they were okay. But the problem is that we are so far removed. Remember, we're a people who, for whom it's mainstream to mutilate children. You know, so I mean, yeah. we we we're. we're it's very difficult for us to understand a lot of these things. Um, very difficult indeed. And the thing that I thought was was interesting about Flyboys was simply the fact that James Franco uh, had no chemistry with the female, but a lot with uh, his best friend. Now, I'm not saying he's, you know, differently abled. What I'm saying is that we can't even portray romance well anymore. Well, we, we, we can't portray romance because what's the making of a good love story? The making of a good love story is heroic virtue. 
Um, we don't do oh, virtue. We, 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 we no. don't do virtue. We don't do heroes well. Um, no. I mean, okay. Uh, five seconds. Name name a hero. That's not in a Marvel movie or a comic movie. Name name a good protagonist. It, it's it's pretty hard, right? Um, Superman. Past ten years, right? So, um, we don't know how to do that anymore. Uh, it, but at by contrast, we explore absolutely every facet of evil. We've got evil down to a T. We really, really. I mean, if you look at all the roles, um, some of the most interesting roles, e- like evil roles, like obviously, um. You know, No Country for Old Men, Anton Chigurh, Javier Bardem won for that. Um, there Will Be Blood, um, which is um, Daniel Day-Lewis film. I mean, these are all evil people uh, that they've uh, they've really fleshed out. But those are just two examples. Why is that? You know, I wonder, as a society, we know how to portray evil so well, but we just have no grasp of or interest or interest in good. Isn't that Could weird? Be we reflect, well, we reflect our masters and they reflect us. It's a symbiosis. I mean, you know. I, I remember watching, I, I, I got, um, I was watching a really old movie. I was watching an Errol Flynn movie. Ah. And it was on, um, I forgot the name, but it was on the Charge of the Light Brigade, I think. Mm. I think it ended on that. And I... Yeah. It's called the and, Charge of the Light Brigade. Oh, was it? Okay, so it and it was on the two brothers, love triangle, with a with a girl. And I thought it was totally going to go the skeptical like modern route. I thought it was going to be complex. And then and Errol Flynn just straight up was heroic. He ended up overcoming all of the flaws that were set in front of us that I thought were going to go to their natural conclusion, and he overcame it. And I thought, wow, that is so unlike um, our movies today. Did, did you see this uh, movie? Did you see this? Oh, yeah, of course I saw it. Um, in fact, I saw it and I saw the 67, 1967 version when it came out. Yeah. The Earl Flynn version, of course, is, well, I mean, it's a much more admirable, admirable character in the film. It, was, it didn't have that much to do with what actually happened. Unlike yeah. the 67, which was almost a painful reconstruction. But, uh, yeah, you know, again, that was that they built up the idea of virtue. There was a, a movie I recommend very highly to you called Gunga Din. Uh, and basically it's taken from a Kipling poem uh, about the uh, this British regiment in India. And they have a um, a uh, Indian beastie, a water boy, who brings the water, you know, to to the dying and to the well, not just dying, but to anybody. Uh, and he's not treated very, very well. Uh, but in the end, uh, in the movie, he saves the day. Now they take that from the poem, and the poem is kind of interesting, partly because it's an illustration of virtue, but also because Kipling was always attacked as the uh, white supremacist, evil colonialist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, by the moron crowd. You can always tell the morons because they say things like that. But Gunga Dean is, as I say, a poem by Kipling that was turned into the film. And it goes like this. And you'll have to pardon my bad British accent, but it's the way it's written. <laughs> You may talk a gin and beer when you're quartered safe out here, and you're sent to penny fights and Aldershot it. But when it comes to slaughter, you will do your work on water, and you'll lick the bloomin' boots of him that's got it. Now in Inja's sunny clime, where I used to spend my time a servant of Her Majesty the Queen, of all them black-faced crew, the finest man I knew was our regimental beastie, Gungadeen. He was Dean, 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 you limp and lump of brick dust, Gungadeen. Hi, slippy hither owl, water get it, pony lowl, you squidgy nose old idol, Gungadeen. The uniform he wore was nothing much before, and rather less than half of that behind. For a piece of twisty rag and a goatskin water bag was all the field equipment he could find. 
when the sweatin' troop train lay in a sidin' through the day, where the eat would make your bloomin' eyebrows crawl. We shouted Harry by till our throats were bricky dry. Then we whopped him, cause he couldn't serve us all. It was Dean, 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 you even, where the mischief have you been? You put some jewelry in it, or I'll marrow you this minute, if you don't fill up my helmet, Gunga Dean. He would dart and carry one till the longest day was done, and he didn't seem to know the use of fear. If we charged or broke or cut, you could bet your bloomin' nut he'd be waiting fifty paces right flank rear. With his musket on his back, he would skip with our attack and watch us till the bugles made retire. And for all his dirty eyed, he was white, clear white inside, when he went to tend the wounded under fire. It was Dean, 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 with the bullets kicking dust belts on the green. When the cartridges ran out, you could hear the front rank shout, Hi, ammunition mules and Gungadine. I shan't forget the night when I dropped behind the fight with a bullet where my belt plate should have been. I was choking mad with thirst, and the man that spied me first was our good old grinning, grunting Gungadine. He lifted up me head, and he plugged me where I bled, and he gave me half a pint of water green. It was crawling and it stunk, but of all the drinks I've drunk, I'm gratefulest to one from Gungadine. It was Dean, 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 is a beggar with a bullet through his spleen. He's charring up the wound and he's kicking all around. For God's sake, get the water, Gungadine. He carried me away to where a dooley lay, and a bullet come and drilled the beggar clean. He put me safe inside, and just before he died, I hope you liked your drink, says Gungadine. So I'll meet him later. Uh, I'll meet him later on at the place where he is gone, where it's always double drill and no canteen. He'll be squatting on the coals, giving drink to poor damned souls, and I'll get a swig in hell from Gungadine. Yes, Dean, 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 you Lazarusian leather Gungadine, though I've belted you and flayed you, by the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Gungadine. Wow. Oh, but it's just oh, it just radiates colonialism, and oh, and it's it's structures of power and and white uh, privilege and and male supremacy and OG Willikers. I think it's the opposite. I'm sorry. I think I thought it was the opposite. I felt the opposite. Of course, it's the opposite. But see, the mealy mouth morons and munchkins that run the educational establishment today and the media and government, not that we're, you know, pointing the finger, they can't get it because they're stupid. (laughs) And you know what stupid is? The marriage of arrogance and ignorance. Oh, it's just terrible. How could you? Obviously. He was in a subservient position, and 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 just and yeah, Weenieism again. Weenies, weenies everywhere, and not a man to think. <laughs> the original was water, water everywhere, and none of it to drink. But never mind. No, and this, you know. You can tell how rotten the literary establishment is. That they despise Kipling, Longfellow, um, all our greatest poets in English. They're, oh, they're this, they're that. Oh, gee, Willikers. Oh, gee. Yeah, well, you know, each of them, my little munchkins, had more talent and more real understanding of the human condition than you and all your crew will ever have in your entire lives. Oh, but what about cisgendering Gungadine? What about the lack of the lack of uh, female uh, strong female characters in Gungadine? I mean, I don't understand. Jesus. I'm like getting teary get over it. this poem. I mean, these people have to be straight up sociopaths. I mean, if this if that poem doesn't tug at your heartstrings as a man, like 
No. Like, I mean, that that's beyond weenieism to me. That's that's something special. Get like that's corroding your soul. Um, wow. Well, I agree with you. If you're unaffected by Gunga Dean, um, and you're a man. If you're a woman, I can see why it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. But if you're a man, and it doesn't really... It's unbelievable. Then, you know, what good are you? Oh, but we don't teach Kipling anymore. We teach Sylvia Plath. Go away, please. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Gee. Wow. Just go away. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I'm sensing a lack of understanding, a lack of openness to other views. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Now that would be that would be a reenactment thing for some show. Rudyard Kipling and <laughs> Sylvia Plath. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Do you know how upsetting my my life was? Says Sylvia Plath. Madam says Rudyard Kipling. You don't know the meaning of upset. Oh, yeah, well, I killed myself. Yes, well. <laughs> Oof. Okay. Um, I'm still recovering from the poem, to be honest. I'm still, like, I'm still, like, in the aftermath. I'm, like, in the wake of, of that poem. Um, well, Kipling, you've never heard uh, it before? No, I've never heard that poem. I, I know. I mean, my, my brother has this huge, giant stack of uh, uh, this book, which is the, I guess, the uh, collection of you know uh, Kipling's poetry, so I know I know he's a master. I've read some of them, but I have not read that one. Well, and you, you've read you're... his other one too, um, which is very—it's unbelievably masculine. Uh, oh, I remember if. if that's right. If that was yeah. another one that is very challenging, and I love it. Um, uh, at a, at the recessional. Probably I don't. Re- that didn't. Uh, you want to read the it? Recessional, it's poetry. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't mind. We'll do, do a little poetry. Sure. Why not? Uh, I told you what Ray Bradbury said about Kipling. Um, what did he say? Well, it was the first time I met Bradbury. It was, he invited me to a lecture he gave at Hollywood High when I was in high school. And uh, I was on kind of a Kipling tear because my father had taken me to see the man who would be king. And then I had to read everything by Kipling I could get my hands on, and I did. So during the um, uh, questions and answers of uh, Ray's lecture, I raised my hand and I asked him, what do you think of Richard Kipling? And he says, you know, I'm really glad you asked that question. He said, when I was about your age, I took the bus all the way to New York to see Lord Dunsany, the great Irish fantasy writer, give a lecture. And I asked him in questions and answers who he thought the greatest writer of literature in the 20th century had been. And he responded, young man, the greatest writer of literature in the 20th century was Rudyard Kipling. And then Bradbury said, nothing I have seen or read in the years since then has caused me to disagree with that assertion. So Kipling had the Ray Bradbury seal of approval. Okay, here it is, recessional. Now, this was composed for the uh, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, where the British Empire was very much at its height. So, recessional by Rudyard Kipling, 1897. God of our fathers, known of old, Lord of our far-flung battle line, beneath whose awful hand we hold dominion over palm and pine, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet lest we forget, lest we forget. The tumult and the shouting dies, the captains and the kings depart. Still stands that ancient sacrifice, an humble and a contrite heart. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Far called our navies melt away, on dune and headland sinks the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. Judge of the nations, spare us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. If, drunk with sight of power, we loose wild tongues that have not thee in awe, such boastings as the Gentiles use, 
or lesser breeds without the law. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. For heathen heart that puts her trust in reeking tube and iron shard, all valiant dust that builds on dust and guarding calls not thee to guard. For frantic boast and foolish word, thy mercy on thy people, Lord. Yeah, obviously, I, I didn't know the name of that poem was Recessional, but you recited that, Veterans Day, and yeah, obviously, that's another, that's a big one. Um, that, that actually, that poem actually inspired me to observe Veterans Day more strongly, and for one, get a little little pin, red poppy, yeah. it says, lest we forget. Um Oh, you, you you didn't get a, a United Nations pin? No. No. Okay. Whew. Okay. Well, that's what good poetry affects you. It moves you. Uh, would you like to hear from something by Sylvia Plath? <laughs> no, no, please. Uh, okay. All right. Don't say I didn't offer. Okay. Uh Whew, this has been a full episode. We still got two good, two really good questions to go. All right. Uh, Let's go. All right. Superfan Philip says, Recently I rewatched Alfred Hitchcock's entertaining 1938 film, The Lady Vanishes. This was a film that paved the way for Hitchcock's transition to Hollywood from the British film industry. And it has exceedingly witty script that brought to my mind the intellectual engagement of classic stage plays. In watching this film, I was reminded that Hitchcock was raised a Catholic. To my perception, Hitchcock has a complex Catholic sensibility, even down to his ribald humor. Does Charles think of Hitchcock as a Catholic filmmaker? Related to this are, or, or, excuse me, related to this, are there identifiable Catholic humorous modes, even off-color ones, and what typifies them? Hmm. Wow. Well, I would definitely consider Hitchcock, although he wasn't the best of Catholics, I would definitely consider him a uh, Catholic filmmaker. Um, the faith comes up from time to time in strange ways in his movies. Uh, even Westminster Cathedral in one of them. I don't remember which, but I remember it came up uh, because one of the characters was trying to hide out there. Um, the Catholic sensibility in this sense, is interesting because it's related It's related very much to a juxtaposition of opposites. In other words, we have, on the one hand, we have feasts and we have famine. No, famine, no. Feasts and we have fasts, both of which the, 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 the better we are, the more the more strictly we keep the fasts and the more uh, jovial we keep the feasts. Similarly, uh, celibacy and fertility are two great callings, um, both of which open themselves up to a great deal of humor. Um, and of course, that's the other thing, you know, for the Catholic, just because you joke about something doesn't mean you don't believe in it. Quite the contrary. Uh, your belief is, if it's strong, um, you can make jests about things that are sacred to you. I mean, up to a point. You don't want to be blasphemous. But, uh, you know, if I had a dime for every... Um, uh, well, you know the, the old joke about uh, our Lord and the lady caught in adultery. Yeah, you. Yeah, you don't just have one husband; you have five, or <laughs> something like that. Right? Well, no. Well, well, he said that that was actually the Bible. But oh. said, said Mary Magdalene is brought before him oh. uh, to be um, to be uh, uh, judged, and he says, "Let uh, you who let you who is without sin cast the first stone." He was supposed to be stoned to death. So he says, all right, that's fine. Let who among you who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, the joke has it that a single rock then flies out from the mob and hits Mary Magdalene on the forehead. And our Lord says, mother. 
Oh, wow. That's, I mean, sure, okay. It's it's funny, but it's also an affirmation of the American conception. Yeah. And it's actually not irreverent. I mean, it is in a sense, but not really. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, interesting. The, but the everything you said just now, I, I could sense the Chesterton influence on you because um, obviously the big quote, from him on this is uh, he says it is the test of a good religion whether you can joke about it yeah. that's very that's very thought provoking actually if you think of, there's a lot of, to unpack to that um, he's so well, brilliant you, you remember the one thing the devil can't take is to be laughed at yeah and if he can't take being laughed at well then the truth can take a couple of, a bit of laughter and, you know, I have to admit, I've found a bit of humor in the Bible. Hmm. Uh, well, I just showed, like, the scene that I identify as humorous, where I almost wonder if Jesus is making a joke. Like, yeah, you don't have one husband. You have five. You have five. <laughs> you have spoken well, yeah. yeah. yeah like... Or, well, for that matter, you know, when he's, when he's in the garden after the Last Supper and they can't stay awake. Yeah. And then he says, rest now and take your uh, <laughs> sleep now and take your rest for the hours <laughs> at hand. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's either a joke or it's sarcasm or whatever it is. And, of course, uh, my personal favorite is from the um, Epistle of St. James, where St. James writes, for what, what good does it do if you say, be thou warmed, be thou fed? Without giving them anything to eat or to warm themselves. That's very. <laughs> <laughs> be thou warm. Be fed. That's so. I mean, how how can that not be a joke? I mean, that's ri so uh, ridiculous. It, it, <laughs> it has to be. It has to be sarcasm. It has to be, uh, you know, uh, laughter. <laughs> of course, I have to admit that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of mankind's foibles. You can't help but think that God was uh, smiling a bit when He made us. Yeah. Because we are we are such funny creatures in so many ways. Uh, I mean, I have always said that. Uh, I knew that Adam was my forebear because he was able to try to weasel out of the question with not one but two cop outs in one sentence. It was the woman you gave me. Right. Notice that the fault is Eve's and it's God. Somehow he's just this helpless witness. Yeah. Oh I identify completely with Adam in that particular area. Hmm. Yeah, they say um I don't Obviously, this isn't gospel. We, this is a big jump. But in the apparitions, I believe, uh, I don't know if it was Fatima, but that Mary laughs at some of the, the simplicity of the people when, when they're confused. And I don't know if it's a full-out laugh, but it's, it shows some amusement. Like, um, But obviously, that's up to interpretation. But um, anyhow, I just thought I'd mention it. All right. Um, you're in Windy Field. Hello, Windy Field. Oh, <coughs> oh is she dancing? Uh, <laughs> how long? How long have we known this woman anyway? We go back. All right. Uh, final question I'll, today. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a back off. <laughs> we told you it was. I take it as a back. Okay. All right. Final question today is from John. Um. And, he says, we often talk about millennials being in a perpetual state of adolescence. Do you think this is in relation to the fact that we have encouraged the youth to postpone marriage and parenthood? That's a very good question. I would say partly, but only partly because we haven't given them, and by we I mean my generation, we haven't given them very adult examples in everyday life. I mean, 
All right, I'll put you this way. Let's say you've got two kids. And you and your wife are not really getting along very well. And to be honest, you're not terribly happy with the setup. What do you do if you're a man? If we're not happy with what? The setup? You're not you're not happy with the setup in your marriage. You know, you're you're not happy with your wife. Um, you have two kids. Uh, your wife doesn't understand you. She can be annoying, etc. What do you do? Well, I don't know. According to, I mean, you pray and then you suffer through it, and then you earn graces for your family that way. I don't exactly. know. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> and okay. You, and and you give your kids an example. Yeah. And in, in, you also give them the message that they're more important to you than your own happiness. Hmm. But what do most people do today? That's true. Get a divorce, call yeah. it quits. And, yeah. uh, and very often the kids become out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. And I have to say, I don't, I mean, I've never had any children. But if I had any, I don't see how I could do that. Hmm. But I know plenty of people who have, so it can't be done. It's not impossible. Um, but this sort of manhood is in all kinds of things. This sort of uh, womanhood is in all sorts of things. The way people hold themselves, the way they dress, the way they act, the way they speak, the way they treat the other gender. All these things we have not taught our children well. Um you know, just to give you one example, I only had a brother. I didn't have any sisters, so I don't know what that's like. But I remember many, 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 many years ago, uh, would have been about 1982, I was interviewing for a job with the uh, fabulous uh, Century Plaza Hotel. And the girl who was supposed to give me my orientation she walked beautifully. So, in such a feminine way. Because, you know, even by then, most girls didn't really know how to walk in a feminine manner. They just sort of clomped along like guys. Um, but this woman glided as she walked. And swung her hips and, and just, it was a beauty to watch her. And I couldn't help myself. I complimented her on the way she walked. And she laughed. And she said, we'll have to thank my mother for that. I said, oh, she taught me to walk. She said, you know, women have to learn to walk in a feminine manner. Otherwise, they'll walk like guys. And it's true. And seeing a woman walk like a woman is much more attractive than seeing her walk like a man. But that was part of bringing kids up. They learn things like that. And I mean, the same, the same uh, these are small little things, but uh, I remember my dad, when I was young, he was always after me to pick up my feet. Well, that was important. Uh, and to walk heel to toe, heel to toe. Because you know what happens if you walk uh, toe to heel? Toe to heel? What? what you yeah. Trip over yourself or what? I don't know. No, it looks like you're you're flouncing along. Hmm. But you walk heel to toe, and you you know you walk in a solid manner. But uh, you walk toe to heel, and it's like you're trying to take off uh, take off into the airwaves. Hmm. It looks strange. Well, these are small things, but they're the kind of things. The parents used to teach their kids. I think there are a lot of things. I mean, it, it, to directly tackle John's question, do you think this uh, um, that um, we're in state of adult, perpetual state of adolescence because postponed marriage? I would say I, it's part of it. it it's part of it. There's so but, much of it. But it also, I, the, in other words... Like people who choose a single life are perpetually adolescent, so that that's not entirely 
Um, well, I, I mean, uh, well, I can I can tell you from personal experience, there is a sense, frankly, if you stay single and you don't turn bitter, because that that can happen. But if you don't turn bitter, uh, you do keep a sort of youthfulness to you that you would probably not have had if you'd had children. Uh, you know where you'll see a similar thing is where you get a married couple who haven't been able to have kids despite trying. And if they don't sour on each other, if they stay, you know, happy with one another, there's always a slight giddiness to them, like newlyweds, which with most married couples goes away. But as I say, it doesn't, if they, if they remain attached to each other, uh, that little bit of, of newlywed style giddiness remains with them forever. Just like the, the single person will always have a little bit of the adolescent about them. Mm. A little bit of the kid. And that's because if you don't have children, uh, there, there are both joys and, uh, miseries you will never know i see uh you just can't um i mean you you could know them intellectually you could see them secondhand with other people's kids but you don't have them yourself right uh, i mean you, you you can't know what it is to put tons of effort into a kid and see him succeed or tons of effort and see him fail or see him slough off everything you've tried to do, or see him do far better than you could ever have imagined he had done. I mean, these, good or bad, these sensations, if you will, are reserved to the, uh, to the uh, parents. And they have an effect on them. They do have an effect. Uh, parents who... Uh, are happy with the way their children turn out, have joys the rest of us don't know. And those who are unhappy have pains the rest of us can't know. Um, what do you think about... Um, so it seems like nowadays it takes a person a long time to figure out what they want to do. I know it took me a very long time. Uh, we just posted a mini segment on this, right? Uh, wasted yeah. my 20s. Now I'm in my 30s. I'm just scrambling. I'm just floundering. What do I do? Uh, and that's a common experience. It's one that I went through. My, um, I remember my, my advice to you was give up. <laughs> <laughs> so, but is that testament to something in the environment in this day and age, the fact that it takes longer to, to find – and I mean, maybe maybe it's because I was I just wanted to be a child longer. Maybe that's that's part of the thing. I don't know. Uh, partly, but also you have access to a lot more stuff, a lot more ideas, a lot more information, a lot more things than you would have normally in the old days. Yeah, it's like blacksmith, uh, carpenter, farmer. P take your pick, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and so. You know, it's tough. Hmm. I see. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of wonderful stuff about the whole, uh, about the whole, um, what's the word? Information age. But it does make making choices much more difficult because you know a lot more about things that you would not have known about before. Uh, and that can rouse envy. I mean, stop and think for a second. Uh, let's say that you were one of these folk who decided to become a librarian. Now, being a librarian is a wonderful thing, especially if you love books. But with the wealth of stuff out there, um, why should I be a librarian 
when there's this, 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 and this, I could do instead. Uh, so that's, yeah. That's, I, I that's, think that makes sense because obviously librarians are relatively humble, uh, modest uh, profession. Yeah. And so I and, and steeped in learning in books and knowledge. So obviously that's a perfect example. Okay. Um, so do you think – okay. I don't know. I guess that's it. Well, um, uh, not exactly. Uh, not exactly. What I think is that we need more love. We have plenty of the, love, but it's in all the wrong places. No, the best way to express love is by trick or treating for UNICEF. All right, forget that. I'll give you a better way to explore love. Are you ready? Ready. Explore poetry. So as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm going to make some poetic recommendations, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready? Ready. All right. I would say, just taking these at random, and this is by far, and far, far, far from an, exhaust, an exhaustive list, but I would recommend the following poets to explore. Uh, starting, of course, with dear old William Shakespeare. Um, the uh, let me see who else we got. William Shakespeare. Um, well, now I'm going to I'm going to fast forward because they're 18th century folk, but they don't grip me quite as much. But uh, Keats, Shelley, Byron, Wordsworth, and Coleridge. Sally, Edgar Allan Poe, Longfellow, um, Lord Tennyson, Kipling, and um, I think that'll do it for now. I do like a, a couple of Walt Whitman's poems, admittedly. Um. Oh, Captain, my Captain. I don't know. I Some of them work. But maybe it's the additional context with movies that sort of harnesses them. You know, where it's like, it's not just, oh, Captain, my Captain. But then it's like, yeah. oh, Captain, my Captain in the context of the Dead Poet Society movie. Yes. Um, that's... Kind of like that. So. Ah, All a little right, hot sauce good. on the poetry. Anyhow, okay, you know, I, this is so inspiring. I feel like like ha adding a, a a poetry section to the bookstore. Like no one's n no one buys poetry to be honest, but I don't care. I'm going to add a poetry section. So Well, you you know what? Since we're doing this, before we close out, I think a poem by H.P. Lovecraft would be helpful. I feel like that's kind of a a left turn. <laughs> yeah, it, it literally. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I do, I do love a lot of ballads, you know, and okay. I do love a lot of 18th century popular poetry. Well, Lovecraft did an imitation. Oh, he wrote a lot of poems actually, and he was a good poet. But um, this one was a drinking song, and what I find remarkable about it is that. Uh, he didn't drink. You know? That, okay. He didn't drink alcohol. Which I find amazing. That's that interesting. He write because, yeah, because because I would think that teetotalers would have this sort of resentment toward, yeah. you know, dr people who drink, people who enjoy the feeling. You know, it's partying. It's like you're you're being a stick in the mud. You know what I mean? Like Yeah. But Okay. So he Let's wrote go. this, and this is supposed to be, uh, it's the drinking song from the tomb. It's an imitation of an 18th century drinking song. So you've got to imagine it's the 18th century. Here we go. Come hither, me lads, with your tankards of ale, and drink to the present before it shall fail. Pile each on your platter a mountain of beef, for tis eating and drinking that bring us relief. So fill up your glass, for life will soon pass, 
When you're dead, you'll let a drink to your king or your lass. Anacreon had a red nose, so they say. But what's a red nose if you're happy and gay? Gad split me. I'd rather be red will stop here than white as a lily and dead half a year. So Betty, my miss, come give us a kiss. In hell, there's no innkeeper's daughter like this. Young Harry, propped up just as straight as he's able, will soon lose his wig and slip under the table. But fill up your goblets and pass them around. Better under the table than under the ground. So revel and chaff as your thirstily quaff. Under six feet of dirt, tis less easy to laugh. The fiends strike me blue, I'm scarce able to walk, and dem me if I can stand upright and talk. Here, landlord, bid Betty to summon a chair. I'll try home for a while, for my wife is not there. So lend me a hand, I'm not able to stand, but I'm gay whilst I linger on top of the land. That's really surprising. I'm kind of taken aback that... I mean that that's that's true artistry where it's like um, I mean it's like almost reinventing yourself or something. I don't know, going outside of yourself and going into this other spot. I mean, is I had such a, a different uh, impression of Lovecraft's attitude and um, character, and that what he wrote seems outside of his character. He you know was what I a great mean? Great artist. Yeah, he was a great artist. He could do that. You know, to be remember to be a very good writer of fiction is in a lot of ways a lot like being a great a great actor. Mm. Because you're expressing very often views and things etc that aren't your own. Mm. You know, the difference of course is where the actor portrays a character someone else has made up. You're making up the character out of whole cloth. That having been said, though, there's another uh, piece. So this will be the last, I promise. But um, I, uh, I, this one, I really, what's that? I was, I was going to make a joke. I was going to say, okay, just the last one. We're going to close with the, uh, your 40-page Ode to Summer. That's right. <laughs> uh, the... Um, so, uh, is this going to be another Lovecraft one? Yes, but it, this this is much more like him, and frankly, it it uh, it's it's from the the uh, fungi from uh, Ugoth. There are several. There are quite a number of these, and they're they're only partly connected. Uh, there are two of them that I'll read you the one just because it's scary, but the other, because it really sums him up. And I, I feel a great deal in common with the other one, but this is the first one. It's called the howler. They told me not to take the Briggs Hill path. that used to be the high road through the Zor for Goody Watkins hanged in 174 had left a certain monstrous aftermath. Yet when I disobeyed and had in view the vine hung cottage by the great rock slope, I could not think of elms or hemp and rope, but wondered why the house still seemed so new. Stopping a while to watch the fading day, I heard faint howls as from a room upstairs. When through the ivied panes one sunset ray struck in and caught the howler unawares, I glimpsed and ran in frenzy from the place and from a four-pawed thing with human face. Weird enough for you? It's definitely um, magical, so it's like a okay. So it's just some sort of beast, and then it's yeah, in, a, in some enchanted place. That's more on brand. That's more on brand. Well, this will really uh, will really get here. Uh, this is called background, and I have to say, I think this was really Lovecraft speaking for himself, and in a sense, he speaks for me too. I never can be tied to raw new things, for I first saw the light in an old town, where from my window huddled roofs sloped down to a quaint harbor rich with visionings, streets with carved doorways where the sunset beams flooded old fanlights and small window panes, and Georgian steeples topped with gilded veins, 
These were the sights that shaped my childhood dreams. Such treasures, left from times of cautious leaven, cannot but loose the hold of flimsier wraiths that flit with shifting ways and muddled faiths across the changeless walls of earth and heaven. They cut the moment's thongs and leave me free to stand alone before eternity. Hmm. That's a good one. Oof. See, poems is good stuff. Poems doesn't have to be little bird with your beak pressed up against the pet shop window. There is no bird scene for you today, only deaf. Little boy with your nose pressed up against the candy shop window. There are no jelly beans for you today, only deaf. <laughs> Oh, man. That was my ma's all-purpose beat, beatnik poem. Sorry, I'm writing that down because I want to create that as a short for everyone to enjoy. A little little short video. All right. Um, what? Of, of, uh, oh, of the, the, the little bird poem? The little bird poem, yeah. yeah it's a, <laughs> touch of the, a touch of 50s beatnikery. <laughs> Would you like to have been a beatnik in the 50s? For a day. <laughs> for, beatnik for a day. Beatnik, beatnik for, for a day. It sounds you know? like a game show I, mean, I want well, nothing to do with. Well, I, don't you ever have that where it's like uh, you go to a place? It's like, ah, oh, it'd be cool to, to, you know, it's a great place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here. I feel like that about, um, like, New York. Like, I, I, I like visiting New York. I like staying there, but I wouldn't want to live there. Um, All right. Let me ask you. If you had had your druthers, would the family have stayed running their section? <laughs> let, let me rephrase. Be, be careful. Would you? No. Have, yeah, yeah, it's, I'll, I'll choose my words carefully. Would you have preferred that the family stay in the business back in New York? Or do you prefer what they ended up doing in, a, in California. I think it was definitely the, uh, the good move, a good move. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of opportunity out on the West coast. So yeah, I mean, easy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess back home, the competition was kind of cutthroat. Yeah. It's pretty crowded. <laughs> it's pretty crowded. Um, you know, well, they were real pistols. Some of them. Yeah, I'll say. You know, kind of triggered easily. <sighs> I shouldn't make <laughs> jokes like that. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. I apologize. Uh, you got me feeling anyway, insecure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we can't have that. We can't have that. You know what? You know what? Just for you, this Halloween, to do something for your insecurity... I may very well go trick or treat for UNICEF. Would they accept if you actually collected fun? Uh, that's actually an interesting racket. If you could trick or treat for UNICEF, but then you keep you pocket all the money that you. Oh, I, I, you know, we heard horror stories about that, and actually, the truth of the matter is, we asked our dad about it. He said, "Kids." I highly doubt any of the money you pick you pick up is going to make it to the kids in Africa. I wouldn't worry about it. Just get your camping. <laughs> oh, that was my dad's take on it. So he he thought we would be uh, going on a fool's errand. Were, to, were you worried? I that I like the way he said that. Just don't worry about it. Just get your candy. <laughs> well, because they made such a big deal about it. You know, the idea was that if uh, you were selfish, if you just went out to get your candy and weren't trick or treating for UNICEF. That dad said that. That was really their marketing message to five-year-old kids? You better well, give us the money or you're selfish? They didn't put it quite like that. <laughs> I mean, that's... But the, the implication was semi-clear. Good good children trick-or-treat for <laughs> That's still you know, children unbelievable. Who, children who think of others. Wow. I think, you know... What we should do, uh, before we close the show, ladies and gentlemen, let us know if you yourself ever trick-or-treated for UNICEF 
and share your experiences. If you have for real and you post a good comment yeah. and it's real, I will read it on the show. Uh, yeah. Because I don't even believe that anyone here is – well, I mean, we've got some old-timers that always tell me how, how new I am and, and uh, lack old-timers, of knowledge. Is, is this ageism now? This is ageism. This is, this is your, your people, your, your old people, um, or, or, or people who are the same age as old people. Excuse me. Thank you very much. You know, we should have that as a uh, as a uh, uh, oh gosh, what do you call it? An acronym. People who are the same age as old people. We should have the initials. You know, people. P W A P W A T Pwat. Well, that's not very good. Uh, Pwats. That's a weird one, Charles. Platsop. Platsop. That's another Platsop. People is the same age as old people. I don't know if that quite works, but... All right, last question for you. Last yeah. of three. I have three questions to okay. ask you. Okay. The first is, you still find the picture of Jimmy Stewart with his friend Harvey uh, weird. Yes, it is unsettling. weird. You saw it because it was on my... It was in our chat window, and it reminded you of it. It's weird because he's got a bow tie, but what does he got a bow? What does he have a bow tie on? He's a giant rabbit, but he's also not a rabbit. He's got humanoid form, so he, he's not a proper rabbit. He's, he's like half puka. rabbit. He, he's half rabbit, half human. Like a wear bunny. You know, a honestly, bunny. honestly, he could be that same beast in um the poem you just read, where I was like, there had human elements, right? But then he's got a paw. H.P. Lovecraft could have could have done his a uh, creepy poem about Harvey. Oh gosh! <laughs> the imagination is now really running wild. <laughs> Harvey by H.P. Lovecraft. Oh man, he would be an emissary of the great old ones trying to break in from outside, and Elwood P. Dowd would be his unwitting accomplice, helping to break open the 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 pathway between the worlds. That would be really awful. H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft's Harvey, a musical. Imagine that. That, that would be really awful. That would, that would be awful, awful, awful. <laughs> you know, well, ladies and gentlemen, this, this query is going to appear on Twitter and all that for me. So if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook or anything else, in the next few minutes, I'm going to ask... What if Harvey had been written by H.P. Lovecraft? <laughs> oh, man, that would be... Uh, now, now, see, if you think of that, it takes on a really sinister look. That's for sure. Then it turns into, into Jimmy Stewart as being sort of a pet of, of this <laughs> this thing of Cthulhu's. The, uh, well, you know, like the goat, of, the goat with a thousand young is the, the bunny with... Yeah. Bow tie. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So that's that's the, the, the one question. Now this second question. What is it? What do you think it might possibly be? What, what according to your understanding, your belief, etc., what might it be if it is, in fact, Monday? Well, it's off the menu. And taking that premise starting with that basic premise and bearing in mind the the erosion of public values due to racism sexism ageism ableism and the other things that have afflicted us for so long um whose soul might be safe it may be your own god bless you ladies and gents we shall see you next week